reflect a little bit more deep in a number of them. Many of the CSO asks at ACRA actually are still reflected, unfortunately, in our proposals today for High Level Forum 4. Unfortunately, I say, because we haven't achieved many of these yet. A focus on human rights approaches with a recognition of the centrality of poverty reduction, gender equality, social justice, decent work, and environmental sustainability. Strengthening civil society actors and development through democratic ownership, addressing the imbalances of power and donor partner country relationships, and committing to measuring progress against meaningful indicators. These are all still on our agenda. And we had mixed reviews of the outcomes of ACRA, but we saw some important progress there on norms. A more inclusive, but not yet democratic understanding of country ownership and policy process. A passing acknowledgement of human rights and gender equality. More attention to standards for improved transparency. And finally, the big gain at ACRA that's been mentioned already this morning, recognition as development actors in our own right and a commitment by other aid actors, donors and governments to create an enabling conditions to maximize CSO contributions to development. But much of our ACRA agenda remains largely unfinished business, as I've said. The unfinished business has actually shaped our priorities and the work that we've done over these past three years. We've organized ourselves globally, regionally, nationally to create a shared understanding of issues in aid and development effectiveness, much of your work. We've carried out numerous dialogues with government and donor officials on the implementation of Paris and ACRA commitments. And we took advantage of unique opportunities that we have as full members of the working party to shape this agenda for Busan. But I want to expand a little more on three dimensions of this. First, engagement inside in a multi-stakeholder policy process. Second, our efforts with civil society to address issues of our own effectiveness and the enabling conditions required to be effective development actors. And third, your work to deepen engagement at the country and regional level to affect change where it mattered. All three of those dimensions shaped the work that we did in the past three years. So first, we've learned a lot about how to carry forward our agenda within multi-stakeholder policy processes. Working with officials from donors and developing country governments, as well as parliamentarians, taking full advantage of this role, uh, or this membership in the working party and its executive committee since late 2008. As Tony's highlighted this morning, this has been, in many ways, a unique experience for CSOs. The role in the working party has given <coughs> civil society the opportunity to influence from the inside in a unique way, with full access to documents, but also with the right to participate with donors and developing country governments in a range of policy-oriented clusters. These were work streams developing proposals on democratic ownership and accountability, on enabling conditions for civil society development effectiveness, on procurement and use of country systems, etc., etc. And there were many, some would say too many, that often challenged our capacities to be effective. But in doing so, we have not only shaped our own uh, pr uh, proposals and agenda, but actually affected the agenda for the high-level forum. In some clusters, our presence was welcomed and encouraged. The work stream on, in cluster A on democratic ownership and accountability come to mind. In others, often those with highly contested agendas, conditionality or managing for results are examples of those, CSOs have had to continuously push to be included and to ensure our views were reflected in what were said to be consensus building processes on these themes. And many of these cluster debates will be present for the various high-level forum sessions next week. We've made some inroads in this process with stakeholders in some of these clusters that are now reflected here in Busan in the outcome document. Acknowledgement of democratic ownership, not yet achieved, but discussion on linking human rights and enabling conditions for CSOs, or a focus on cooperation for development effectiveness. Working in a multi-stakeholder environment has also meant different ways of working for civil society uh, policy advocacy. We have accepted responsibility to find common positions within, with other stakeholders where the goal is to raise the policy bar for all. However, often, the policy outcomes of these processes have only at best approximated so-called progress when measured against our own agenda. 
So a second important dimension of this work in two, since 2008 has been our work as civil society. As Emily noted this morning, we worked through the open forum to substantially address issues in our own effectiveness as development actors in our own right. This has been a CSO-led initiative, understood by CSOs to be essential and an integral part of our agenda for development effectiveness. Development effectiveness is focused on the capacities of poor and marginalized populations to claim their rights in development, then for CSOs, strengthening our capacities to contribute to development effectiveness means examining our own practices in this regard. But it has also meant challenging the policies and practices of donors and, and governments with the evidence that they have increasingly restricted effective policy uh, CSO roles in development. So quickly through the CSO process of the open forum with uh, consulta numerous consultations in 70 countries, We've done three things, I think. We've obviously achieved a global consensus on a set of principles, the Istanbul principles on CSO development effectiveness. But in doing so, we recognize that implementing these principles is a challenge for all of us. And to help us do that, meet that challenge in carrying these pr pr principles into practice, we have set some guidelines, standards, and approaches in the international framework for CSO development effectiveness complemented by an implementation and advocacy toolkit. And finally, we have initiated dialogue with governments in developing and donor countries at all levels on issues in the enabling environment for CSOs. We have a starting point with some standards agreed by the multi-stakeholder task team on CSO development effectiveness and enabling environment that Carolyn mentioned that I coach you. And these form the basis uh, that have been agreed by the donors and developing country governments and CSOs that have participated within this task team. So we have some starting points, but we have a long way to go. The enabling environment is crucial for CSOs here in Busan. We need better language in the outcome document that stress that CSO enabling conditions must be based on human rights standards derived from internationally agreed treaties and agreements that have been agreed uh, in the task team's report to the high level forum. But clearly our efforts here are not enough. We need to redouble our efforts with others, such as Pacificus or Mr. Kai is going to speak in a few minutes, to address these crucial issues in enabling conditions. CSOs also need to treat the Istanbul principles ourselves seriously. In the coming months, we need to create our own processes to look critically at our practices, our modalities for accountability, and our transparency. And this brings me to the third and final broad area of our work since Accra which is your work at the country and regional level. Through, more than, through many, many different country and thematic consultations in the past 18 months, hundreds of CSOs have been monitoring and implement the implementation of the Paris and Accra uh, agreements on the ground. Have these agreements actually translated into structures and conditions for democratic ownership in aid per, or in aid predictability? How transparent are the actual resources for development cooperation and for budgets? What impact has there been on poverty reduction, decent work, or on women's rights, on the rights of disabled populations or excluded minorities? While most of this work took place under the banner of CSOs as member of Better Aid or the Reality of Aid Network, we are also aware that various networks, faith-based organizations, international NGOs, women's organizations, rural and food sovereignty groups, the International Trade Union uh, Federation, among others, undertook their own parallel processes. These are essential experiences. You have deepened CSO knowledge of the development effectiveness agenda among a broad constituency of CSOs, hence the <coughs> large turnout here at this forum. You have challenged other stakeholders and thereby contributed to more effective implementation on the ground. You have brought this experience to better AIDS engagement with the working party, and now in many of the statements your constituencies have brought here to Busan. No matter what the outcomes of HLF4 next week, they know that you are not going away that your efforts at the country level after Busan will be the critical ingredients for moving forward the real challenge for development for the rights of those living in poverty. The Reality of Aid Network brought together some of your evidence of the gaps in implementation in a special 2011 report called Democratic Ownership and Development.